Giuliani is f why he's been in bankruptcy for a while. That's what gave him the stay from the Dominion suit. I'm not doing f anything with Factorio until uh, after the election, so stop spamming about it. I'm going to add it to the ban list. And you notice, do you have like summaries of your positions or po or on politics and topics like Israel Palestine? Um, summaries? No, I don't. Maybe I could add that to the bottom of my notes, though. How's your general mind level right now over everything? What do you mean, like over like election stuff or what I mean? My mind feels clean because uh, yesterday I. Hold on. I plugged in all of the uh, APC uh, USPs, my power supply things. So I have backup power for the entire studio. All my wires are nice and trapped on the floor so people won't trip over them on the election stream. Um, can you join Discord? Uh, I can after, after I have to chat with this guy. Let me make sure you can get in. It's all nice and pretty. One of my, one of my 1500 watts or amperage hours or whatever um, was defective though, my God. Hey, how's it going? Hey, how you doing? Uh, horrible. And a lot of it is your fault, but, <laughs> um, do you want what? to, uh, uh, do I, I, um, or here, we'll, we'll get into it. Do you want to um, introduce yourself real quick so everybody knows who you are and. Yeah, no, seriously, everything's, it's horrible because of my fault. What's up? Oh, sorry. I'm, I'm, it was tongue in cheek. The, uh, I've been so oh. steeped in a lot of the, uh, January 6th stuff. It has made me so incredibly and unimaginably frustrated um <laughs> but uh like following these conversation lines down with people is just insane but um yeah you mean debating like conspiracy theorists and that kind of thing or yeah and the lack of information that people seem to know about anything involved right. with everything yeah um but yeah well, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll go ahead and introduce myself so mm -hmm. i'm I'm Tom Jocelyn. I was a senior professional staff member on the January 6th committee, and I was the principal drafter of the committee's final report. Um, before that, um, I had a career in counterterrorism and counterextremism for a number of years, testified before Congress more than 20 times. And before that, originally, I was actually an economist. So uh, I've had a long, windy career. Mm -hmm. The um, I guess, uh, so I, I don't know if it was a I think it was one of my fans that connected us, and then we had kind of a chat um, for some, I guess, some quick background on me, although I think you're broadly aware I do politics and I argue with people online and all of that. And uh, one of the big kind of focal points that I've been on over the past couple months has been a lot of the January 6th stuff. Um, for as much as I follow news, it is embarrassing to say that it wasn't until, I don't even know if it was this year or last year, that I knew anything about fraudulent electors or anything about... Jeffrey Clark in the DOJ or anything like there are so many pieces where I was just so ignorant and yeah. Well, I mean, you know, that's, that's okay. I mean, look, I mean, from my perspective, one of the things about January 6th is that January 6th itself, the date that day, that was the culmination of a plot to overturn the election, right? It wasn't, everything wasn't, it wasn't solely about that day. There was a number of steps before that that culminated on that day. And, and as Donald Trump got increasingly desperate in trying to figure out a way to, to stay in power, um, his efforts his efforts really became to focus on January 6th. But prior to that, he had all sorts of other steps he tried to do to overturn his election loss. And one of the things that, that I discovered throughout this whole process is that a lot of Americans are not really familiar with the electoral college process. Um, and how that works. You know, a lot of people think you just kind of go and you vote and the popular vote determines, you know, who wins and who loses. And there's really this electoral college process that in, in my opinion is arcane um, and antiqu you know, antiquated. It's sort of tacked on to the popular vote process between when the votes are cast and counted and when the official uh, winner of the election is certified and ultimately inaugurated, right? And so what Trump and his, his advisors did was they, they found all these steps in the electoral college process and they try to figure out a way to undo those steps or interrupt those steps or, or subvert those steps in the process. And so when you talk about like the fake electors, that was just a parallel reality that they built where they wanted to believe they wanted to, to keep open this idea that Trump really could have won the election and they were have these fake electors. And ultimately, the fake electors became a pretext to obstruct the joint se session of Congress on January 6th. You know, yeah. Um... <laughs> I, 
Yeah, the uh, so one of the projects that I have is hopefully coming to completion. Is uh, I wanted to make a long video, kind of explaining everything that happened. Um, and it's funny because you're saying things that are that are things that I've exactly said. That January six is not really that important. Like that day, it was everything leading up to that day that was so crazy. And that, I, mean, I think it was the culmination. I mean, it certainly yeah. was important. You know, I mean, it, it is. You know, I mean, I know you probably have debated people. I hope mm -hmm. you're by the way recording and just I don't. You know, you can record everything I say. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, the the. Uh, there are a lot of people who try and minimize the vi minimize the violence on that day, or they try to minimize the actual madness of that day. And to me, that's really what January six is about: is about yeah. political sickness, mm -hmm. a madness that you know the the, the crowd that has no right to be. He has no right to summon a mob to Washington and tell him to march on the Capitol. We can get into what he actually did tell him and didn't tell them. But yeah, um, I didn't mean to. Know, I didn't mean to say that the day was irrelevant. Just that, right. like it's yeah, like you said, it's the culmination. Like if I really wanted to explain how horrible J six was, that's going to be the the day itself is the least. I'm going to talk about it's going to be all the stuff leading up to it um, well i mean you mentioned yeah. like the fake electors and one of, one of the things if you go through so if you go through the sort of the how that that part of the scheme i mean one of the ways to think about this and other people have used this analogy so it's i'm not original in saying this but one of the ways to think about this is like a spoken wheel and uh scheme mm -hmm. you know so there are different spokes on the scheme the january 6 wheel so to speak of how to overturn the election and one of them is the fake electors you know that's one of the big big ones and it's integrated into the other parts of the scheme. One of the things that becomes clear from the record is that the fake elector effort, the people who were actually schemed it up, you know, really dreamt it up and came up with it and, and put it into action, knew it was all about obstructing the certification of Joe Biden's victory on January 6th, right? There was no other real legal or political justification for the fake elector effort. This is this is a key point that was missed in a lot of the commentary on this you know because a lot what well, you'll see you'll see sort of lawyers argue well you know in case trump somehow did win one of his election effort in one of his um court efforts in one of the states and they overturn the outcome then they need to have the electors ready just in case just in case that event so that way they could be counted but the people who actually came up with the scheme that's not what they were doing right the evidence is is that they are they put it in writing we know that they weren't counting on any court decision overturning the outcome in any state the fake electors were purely about obstructing joe biden's victory on January 6th. That's what it was all about. And they wanted, there were different ways they could be implemented or used on January 6th, but that was what it was all about. Yeah. Um, just as a quick aside, the, my stream for this is live, so you know, it's not pre-recorded. Oh, okay. so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that, but that's fine. Yeah, yeah just like you great. Um, well, I hide everybody out there. I didn't, yeah. I didn't do it. Yeah, you're good. Well. Um, yep. I just want to say that just in case. And then um, on the second thing, um, yeah, the the one of the frustrating things, and I, I don't know if you do the if you argue. You mentioned that maybe you've argued with people in real life about this. Um, it's frustrating because people will like they'll simultaneously justify like an insurrection or a coup, and then they'll say it didn't happen, right? They'll say things like, well, the fake electors, I mean, like, they were never going to actually use these, of course not. Um, but they had to have them because the election was stolen, and the states weren't doing anything about it, and they needed a way to, you know, counter these things. And it's like, okay, wait, so it sounds like you're justifying Mike Pence basically choosing the president, right? Because you think it was a stolen election. Like, well, no, 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 like, not like that. Like, they, they always, like, play both sides of it. It's very frustrating um, when you yeah, argue so with people about it, yeah. You're talking about the cognitive dissonance, and I, I've dealt with this quite a bit. I mean, they can have, you know, it's it's a it's the same thing. Where they'll say, well, it was all deep state set up because they wanted Trump's patriots to be um, tricked into storming the Capitol and attacking police, so that way they could, you know, crack down on them. But by the same token, it wasn't really that violent, and you know, there really wasn't any anything that happened that day that's really a concern. I mean, it's the same type of cognitive dissonance, yeah. right? And, and a big part of it, we can get into this if you want to talk about it. But I, my whole theory of what actually has happened here is that Trump, more than any other political figure in my lifetime, really did harness the power of the conspiracy web, the conspiracy internet. Mm -hmm. And what you'll find is that, um, you know, if you, if, you, if you study conspiracy theories, there are plenty of conspiracy theories that have like a handful of facts that are interesting or a handful of unknowns. And then they kind of apply all this thinking or assumptions on top of it to turn it into a conspiracy theory, right? And a lot of times those are nonsense and they don't really add up either. But, you know, a lot of times conspiracy theories at least have something or some fact somewhere that, that somebody's glomming onto, right? What you're dealing with with the conspiracy web is a rabid conspiracism. It's just a reflexive belief in anything that's anti-establishment, anti-government, anti-media, anti-democrat, anti-this, anti-that. They're just willing to believe anything. And so, you know, you, you can have people to this day. I mean, you just saw in Pennsylvania, I think it was in Pennsylvania, Elon Musk got on stage and was repeating the Dominion voting system still. You know, Mirror. Yeah, still. I mean, let's talk about how stupid this is, right? I mean, this is a guy who's posting videos on X of rockets being, you know, 
brought back to earth and, and systematically put back in their silo pretty cool technology right reusing the boosters and that kind of thing i don't know I'm, i don't know anything about it it's not, that's far afield for me but it looks pretty cool to me anyway right uh -huh. it, but he's doing all this kind of cool tech stuff and meanwhile he's repeating one of the dumbest conspiracies about january 6 and voting in our country i mean if you're a prophet of high technology which elon musk is with tesla and the electric cars and these rockets and everything else how can you be this stupid to believe or to to, to go forward with this 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 it's not even a theory that Dominion voting systems are something there's something suspect about them. I mean, vote machine technology is about as simple as it gets, right? I mean, you're counting votes and we have the paper ballots. And oh, by the way, in in late 2020, when these myths were being spread online, they actually hand counted the ballots yeah. in places like Antrim County, Michigan, across all of Georgia, right? And what did they find? That the machines were accurate, you know? Mm -hmm. And here's this guy repeating this nonsense to this day. And by the way, hand counting is less accurate. Than machine counting you know you can you can figure out why that is but so this is what is elon musk doing i don't think he's dumb enough to believe this or maybe he is but i don't think he is right mm -hmm. i think he's catering to the same sort of audience online that um really is willing to believe anything there's this well of credulity out there you know yeah the um one of the big things that i talk about and i and i it sucks to talk about it because it's like when you say misinformation is a huge problem Everybody says that, but like half the people that say it are the ones that are the worst perpetrators of misinformation. And right. I think one of the things that surprised me coming into, you know, when I was like, okay, uh, I'm, you know, we're going to, I'm going to read the whole 840 pages of this J6 stuff. Cause let's see, you know, I don't, uh, I think I was arguing with a friend over, did Donald Trump abdicate his duty on J6? So I'm like, I don't know. Was it really his responsibility? And it was a huge argument we had there. Where I didn't think it was that big of a deal that kind of was the uh, inciting moment for me to read the whole thing. And the thing that surprises me is usually when you've got stuff like this, you're relying on like a sequence of events that's really hard to explain without a conspiracy or maybe tep like deposition or testimony from like one person that's like, oh, that's kind of worth looking into. This stuff is there's an abundance of right. so right. it's. So right. much. It's right. so much right. from Republic right. from conservatives, from Republicans. And right. the other side is not denying any of it. <laughs> it's like I mean, yeah, I mean, that's exactly right. I mean, well, first of all, it happened all in front of our eyes, right? Yeah. I mean, that too. It happened on happened on live TV, right? And you know, January sixth is the, the the actual that day, the events of that day, including the attack on the Capitol has to be one of the most recorded events in human history, you know, including by many of the rioters who recorded themselves, you know, uh, you know, quite clumsily, you know, going into the building or attacking cops or whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so the idea that there's some big mystery to solve here is is pretty stupid, right? I mean, you, you've got all this evidence right in front of you. You can see it with your own eyes. And, and you have to be – but the bottom line is, right, you have to want to believe that that what you saw with your own eyes didn't happen, right? You have to want to believe some other – uh, explanation for all this, and that has to do that has to do with the human mind and really the flaws in the psychology, you know, and, and how the human mind do works or doesn't work, you know, because mm -hmm. you can you can amass dozens and dozens of facts, you know, and and show something is wrong and you won't get anywhere. I mean, one of the most frustrating things to me, and maybe you've maybe you've encouraged this, uh, encountered this. I don't know. You could tell me, but is when you know my view is you know I know that my brain is not. Um, you know, perfect, right? I make mistakes in thinking and I make mistakes in sort of how I assess things. But I try and correct them, right? I try and figure out what what's going on and figure out how, you know, how I got things wrong. What I've encountered when it comes to this type of thing, when it, when it comes to January 6th or related issues, right, is that somebody will state something. You can show them definitively that it's false, like the Dominion machines, you know, somehow switching votes from uh, Trump to Biden, right? And you can show them that there was a hand recount. You can show them you know, exactly what happened. And they'll either just wave it away or they'll move on to the next lie, right? They'll yep. move on to the next thing, you know, and without ever questioning, well, wait a minute. You know, I just believe something that's definitively wrong, right? But I'm willing to believe the next thing just because I want to, you know? And that's really, I think, a lot of what's going on. Yeah, they, like what you just said about the hand recount, that doesn't matter anymore. They moved on. They're like, okay, fine, they hand recounted. But they, they, did they, uh, they, they removed the ballots from the envelope so they can't signature verify anymore. Or the signatures might have been fraudulent because they mass mailed up. Like there's, there's nothing. This is why when people argue, like, I don't think they should send out right. ballots without a request. If they didn't do that and they only sent out requested ballots, they'd say, oh, well, people are fraudulently requesting ballots. Like there's no, none of this is good faith at the end of the day. And like right. the proof for this as well is, in my mind, right, 
Um, I, I don't, I'm not, I don't want to dive into a whole bunch of other political things. I don't want to accidentally some things we have a hardcore disagreements with, but like a, a risk one. Okay. Fauci might have said a couple things that were dumb or incorrect relating to COVID. It only takes one statement from Fauci to never believe a single thing that he or the entire medical everything says about vaccines for the rest of yeah. human history. One right. thing. Okay. But if I can show you three plots, okay, from uh, voter fraud that were started in complete the the state farm stuff is a is a lie right that started as a it's lie the, when you yeah. watch the it's, video it's, well, it's, it's, yeah, a, it's also a racist lie but yes sure I mean, yeah, yeah when you watch so i yeah. watched all the state farm videos i watched the six hours of testimony right when when um i think her name is deacon pick or something the she was part of the um litigation for giuliani um and uh, Jenna Ellis's uh, case in, in, in Georgia, when she's going through the video, she says, now here, when they go to 9.59, she, she tells the person operating the video, go ahead 20 minutes, and then they skip ahead 20 minutes. She's like, where did these ballots from under the table come from? Right. And it's like, what they were, you know, because she knows. And I can show you three lies like that. The Dominion voting machine is another thing. That one stupid sure. Pennsylvania thing where 205,000 ballots were oh. received. Yeah, that was that that's was in the report. Yeah, that's it was. Yeah. It's, An hour yeah, later, a guy responds report, on yeah. Twitter and you can click through the yeah. website and see, oh, you see exactly where it is, right? The all three of those lies were repeated on January 6th, right? Why is right. it that I can show you all three of those intentional lies from start to finish so repeated and you still give these people credibility, but one misspeak from Biden or right. from Fauci or whatever and you don't trust it. Well, that 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 goes that, but that goes to belief. Like you said something about not wanting to get in areas of disagreement or whatever. I I'm willing to explore anything, right? I'm willing to be I'm willing to examine any evidence and and say I was wrong about something, right? Um, but what you're dealing with here with this dynamic when it comes to the conspiracism again, this is this doesn't even qualify to conspiracy theory. This is just rabid reflexive conspiracism, you know, paranoia, anti-government paranoia. A lot of times, um, that it doesn't matter how often somebody's disproven in this venue and in, in these beliefs, right? They're just going to continue to believe it anyway, you know? Yeah. Um, and and that, that's what's scary about humanity, right? That's what's scary about all this. I mean, because really, if you think about the American political system, we're supposed to be, you are supposed to have a system where different factions or interests have to compromise at the end of the day. Nobody gets their whole way. But how do you compromise with a faction that is willing to believe such uncompromising things, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's not willing to you know, at any point in time, uh, sort of update their beliefs based on the facts and the evidence, you know, it's, it's just rapidly irrational. Yeah. And there's like a motivation question too. like, if, if you think that, um, like, if you think that pharmaceutical companies are too profit driven and aren't being careful enough with their medical research or whatever, right, there are compromises to be made in that process. Like maybe the FDA has more regulations, maybe there's some other process, whatever. But if you think that they're like intentionally trying to kill you with microchips, well, you're not compromising with that. There is no, you don't compromise with like evil trying to destroy you, you know? Right. right. Exactly. No, yeah. That's exactly it. I mean, but that type of conspiracism, I mean, you know, you look at what's happened, you know, on the political right in our country. I'm somebody who's existed in the political right for a long time, so I know the terrain pretty well, you know. Um, but what what we've witnessed and what's ha what's happened is that it really has been overtaken by the Alex Jones paranoia, you know. I'm in the middle of writing a piece that, that argues Alex Jones is the most influential ideologue on the American right today. I mean, if you go down a list, I mean, Trump endorsed him in December 2015, went on Infowars and talked about what an amazing reputation Alex Jones has. This is, by the way, this is post the Sandy Hook shooting massacre uh, uh -huh. mythology that he and, and lies that he spread, right? He goes on his show and he does that. Um, J.D. Vance was recently, you know, recorded, you know, defending Alex Jones, you know, comparing him to an MSNBC host and saying, you know, basically telling people on the political right to be truth tellers and to stay, stay true to themselves. You can go right down the list, Steve Bannon, Tucker Carlson, right down a whole list of people who've all genuflected at the altar of Alex Jones is crazy, you know? And that stuff has taken over. I mean, that's where the anima animating spirit is on the right. And what worries me the most is that, that you can't, in a political system where you're supposed to compromise and reason and have rational, some level of rational discourse, there can't be any rational discourse with people who um, believe in, and, and don't think in that manner. Or, or even are just lying. Like, I would argue that I have a mom who is, I love her to death. My mom and dad are, they're completely gone to, my mom sends me, my mom will send me story after story. Like, Stevie, did you see what this guy said? Like, mom, I just argued this guy yesterday. He called me a cuck loser. Like, I know who this guy is. Yes, we hate each other. <laughs> She's like, but Stevie, but did you see this right? I was like, mom, yes. Um, yeah. These people know that they're lying. The content creators do. I don't think the ordinary people do. Like, I don't think my mom is necessarily, or these people are operating in bad faith i think they're in such a horrible media environment that they start to believe everything but i notice that when i like I'll, like i just started making bets now i just argued with um uh uh Oyer, owen schroyer or whatever um who's a Infowars loser and he tried I'm to make well, where 
I'm well aware of Owen oh, Troyer, but go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. So we're arguing, and he's trying to make the claim that like we all saw Tucker Carlson. You know, the police let them in, and it was like, oh, okay. You want to bet five thousand dollars here and now that the first person that broke into the Capitol, got into the Capitol, was let in by police or broke in with a riot shield? Okay, because we know who it is, uh, the Dominic Pizzola. We we have the vi- like you said. Is in 4K, 60 FPS, uploaded to YouTube, streamed all over the world, 52 different angles. Like, how can you possibly mind wipe this? Um, yeah. Owen, Schreier, Owen Schreier, I believe, was convicted of entering the Capitol and crimes related to misdemeanors. Or Capitol grounds. Mis- yep. Yeah. Two yeah. months in prison. Yeah. And by the way, I mean, you, you saw he, um, you know, prior to January 6th, I mean, he and, and Alex Jones um, absolutely incited people with the stop the steal fight for Trump stuff, you know, and, you know, some of the more provocative injury, uh, imagery. Mm-hmm. You can actually download the the DOJ's court filing for Owen Troyer from the justice.gov and see the, what was in there. You know, yeah. you can links to the videos, links to everything else. I mean, clearly instigating people, inciting people with crazy nonsense, you know? Yeah. And then afterwards they're just, they play so dumb. Like I'm, like I'm asking him on stage. I'm like, you, you said that, uh, this isn't an insurrection, right? It's like, yeah. It's like you were saying 1776. What does that mean? And he's like, well, 1776 was the, you know, founding of America. I was like, what would you call that event? And he's like, well, you know, it was the revolution. Would you consider it an insurrection? He's like, no, I wouldn't. <laughs> I'm like, wait, what? The- well, 1776 <laughs> is at a minimum violent, right? I mean, yeah, like, know. what do you mean? Yeah, Jesus. Yeah, yeah. the yeah. American yeah. Revolution. Way, I'm, descended is, yeah. from somebody, I'm descended from a young man who fought for the rebels, mm-hmm. you know, the American Revolution. You know, so I take I take American history very seriously, and I take pride in America very his- his- in American history very seriously. And what these guys are, are – selling is really a disfigured patriotism right it's really a, a really a really disgusting um um disfigurement of what patriotic belief should be and what it what it can be you know mm-hmm. and that's that's what bothers me i mean really you know what they're doing is they're they were advocating on behalf of the modern king george not on behalf of democracy or individual liberty or you know freedom or democracy or anything like that they were advocating they were you know working for the modern King George, somebody who wanted to overturn that for his own political ambitions and desires, you know? Yeah. Um, but by the way, I mean, something like that InfoWars host you're talking about, I won't try there. I mean, if if really was about cops let everybody in the building, well, then why didn't you use that as an excuse in your defense to get off from these misdemeanor charges? If it's so easy to show, then you should be able to show that or go back and relitigate it, you know? Yeah. Um, but, but I mean, of course, it isn't. I mean, there's plenty of evidence showing what actually happened, you know? Yeah. Uh, but the, and then there's a we, we call it the uh, the all roads lead to Rome fallacy where every single thing becomes a reinforcement of the conspiracy right if nobody right. was arrested right. it's because nothing happened and we knew it was bullshit if people get arrested well it's because right. we know that it's bullshit they're not even going to be convicted if that's, they get convicted that's the Ray yeah, that's Ray Epps. yeah oh right. my god yeah Ray Epps didn't say anything right. near as much as you guys did right you guys are accusing Ray Epps as one statement um, that he made the night before but we're going to go into the Capitol right. and when he made it. Baked Alaska, these people, all these people have debate. I know. I know. They said that he was a Fed, but they still did it the next day anyway. What the fuck? Know, what are you doing? Yeah, out. what the fuck? I pointed, I, put, I pointed that out in six. I did a 60 Minutes um, episode on that. I think it was, was it earlier this year or last year? I don't even remember anymore. But I did 60 Minutes on that because, you know, they were they asked me why Ray Epps wasn't in the report. Um, and I said because he wasn't important enough to put in the report. You know, if, if you actually read, if you actually read Ray Epps' transcript or watch the interviews with him or anything, you know this guy is not really capable of masterminding anything, let alone, you know, January 6th. And, but, but you know, here's the thing about it, right? This is the, this is where there's this this cognitive dissonance and this real sickness is, is pervasive now. You go back to the footage on January 6th and you watch the footage of Ray Epps that these people like to point to on January 6th itself. Mm-hmm. You know what is right around Ray Epps a lot of times that they don't want you to talk about or they don't, or they don't point out when these conspiracists do this, right? The Proud Boys. Oh, and sure. the Proud Boys, the Proud Boys are instigating the crowd. Yeah. They are instigating the violence. They are instigating the breaches of the outer perimeter of the security of the Capitol, the Peace Circle, and then of the Capitol building itself. Right. Mm-hmm. We just used to mention Dominic Pizzola. That's a two thirteen p.m. Senate wing window. Right. Yep. We know that everybody saw that. But before that, you know, at twelve fifty three p.m. on that day, the Joe Biggs and the Proud Boys, who've been convicted of seditious conspiracy, by the way, and all this has been, you know, litigated in a court of law, they march. A whole group of people to the peace circle, the security there. They instigate the crowd. Ray Epps is there because he's a believer. He believes in Trump's lies. He believes in so. And I, and by the way, I never defend Ray Epps. Right? I, mm-hmm. I wish he had been arrested and and charged earlier. You know, fine by me. I don't defend Ray Epps one bit. You know, but the idea that he's somehow the mastermind, while we have this mountain of evidence showing who the actual masterminds are, the actual instigators are, over and over and over again, shows you how biased these people are and how they're not reasonable. You know. Yeah. And so you have. You have way more patience than I do because I can never debate these people. They would, I would not be able. To, I just would scoff at them. You know? Yeah, it's frustrating. I guess so. A, a question um, 
So I guess a few questions, I guess. So here's the first one. So obviously you guys, um, well, am I allowed to ask, how do you even get tasked with, what was like the path you took to being the person? You can ask me anything. I don't care. I'm an open, open book. So, okay. Well, what's uh, the craziest thing you learned that had a top secret security clearance? No, I'm just kidding. Wait, so, <laughs> I yeah. never had top secret, top, security, top secret security clearance. So. Oh, okay. So you can't tell us what was in Hillary, uh, Hillary's emails or anything. That's fine. Um, <laughs> well, yeah. I think, what, you know, I think what is the, out there now, but, yeah. Yeah. what is the path that you took to get, um, to, to, to be involved with this, I guess. Yeah. Um, I'm basically a nerd. I'm known as a nerd. I'm somebody who likes to accumulate facts and evidence and um, write about them to figure out and explain, you know, what happened, you know, and I'm, I'm kind of known and I was known in the counter extremism, counterterrorism community for doing that foreign policy world. Like I said, I was previously an economist. I did that. And I knew um, Liz Cheney for a long time. I've known her for over 20 years. Um, and she introduced me to others on the committee, you know, Democrats on the committee. And I interviewed with folks and eventually they, uh, you know, hired me to come on and help put Put together a report because basically it's the type of lengthy thing the type of long fact laden research dense you know project that i kind of specialize in so you mm -hmm. know they basically you know wanted a nerd to do that kind of stuff so can you say prior to this any other like big projects you've been involved in that you're particularly oh, proud uh, of or i mean a lot i mean i've got a a peer-reviewed book for columbia university press that came out in 2022 while i was on the committee on um, it's a really a reevaluation of the history of jihadism and foreign terrorism, mainly looking at Al Qaeda and ISIS and the Taliban. I'm, I was really, I did a lot, a lot of work on that. Like I said, I testified more than 20 times before Congress. You can look up my testimony before Congress on numerous occasions on this stuff. Um, I was always the guy that would uh, just sort of no bullshit, right? Like, here's what's wrong, and, you know, I'm going to go at it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of my reputation on this stuff. Before that, though, I, I worked as an economist. Um, you know, I actually wrote. Uh, co-authored co the seminal study of national of thoroughbred horse racing and the economics of that. <laughs> okay. So, I, you know, if, 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 you, if you got into my whole career, you'd be kind of, uh, it, it's, it's interesting. I've gotten to look at all sorts of different industries, topics, and everything else. But basically, I'm a guy who's known to scoop up as much evidence as possible, as many facts as possible, and put it into a story, synthesize it in a way that people can digest it. That's gotcha. sort of what I do. Okay. Yeah. When, you, when you started writing this J6 report, what is like your, what's the beginning of this like, uh, like, how, um, so I, so originally I wanted to put together a 20 minute video. Um, that was mm -hmm. my goal to explain some big things. And then I realized, okay, well, it's probably not gonna be 20 minutes, probably not 30 minutes. And now I have like a 20,000 word script. I'm trying to do it like an under an hour and a half. Um, but the, the hard part is the editorializing, right? Because you have to cut so much because it's just, it's hard to explain everything. When you guys yeah. are deciding what to put in the report, what to keep from the report, like you mentioned, like Ray Apps, and I'm sure there's probably a million other things that you could have added. Exactly. And the report exactly. is lengthy. It took, what, six days in Congress to get through it. It's like an 830 plus page report. Yeah, what was the decision making like for what to keep and what to, to get rid of uh, I don't know it's tough it's tough I mean you know there could you could be you could write versions of like so there are you know there's the introduction or the you know, sort of executive summary which is like 150 pages itself yeah you know I, I didn't really spend much time on that that's one part of the report I didn't spend much time on at all. Um, but chapters one through eight, uh, which are the core of the text, I spent a lot of time on that. And there's a lot of me in those chapters. Some of them I wrote a lot of it. Um, you know, basically, you know, it's an over 800 page report, 845 pages or whatever it is, right? I don't even, I don't even know, depending on how you count it. It easily could be 8,000 pages, to be honest with you. Um, and so the, po the point was, you know, even you take chapter eight, which is the analysis of the attack or, you know, any one of the other components of it, a lot of the other pieces of this could be a lot longer, you know, a mm -hmm. lot, lot longer. But the thing is that I learned in writing for the public a long time ago, the longer you make something, the more readers you lose and you lose the main point, right? Yeah. Like you, you start losing people um, a certain number of words in, you know. Um, I learned, you know, writing articles, some of the best articles I thought, yeah, I, one of the other things I've done is I've been a prolific sort of magazine writer and website writer. And you know, I, I, I helped found a website called Long War Journal, which was really the number one counterterrorism online publication, I would say, for a long time. Um, one of the things I learned was that the articles I was most proud of, and I thought were the smartest, <laughs> were duds. They went nowhere. Yeah. And the stuff, the stuff that I thought was kind of the simplest, sort of most obvious, but shorter, went viral or got you know, caught on a lot. So I, I had that in mind when putting together the report for sure and mm -hmm. working, with, working with others to put together the report, you know. What, um, <clears throat> so there are certain narratives that you can kind of like pick out in terms of like, these are important stories to tell. So stuff relating to Pence uh, is an important story to tell. Um, the, the whole inside the DOJ stuff with Clark 
um, is an important story to tell. Um, were there any stories that you wanted to tell that almost made the cut, but you're like, ah, oh, this is too much, or it's, it's already too long, or whatever? Do you think there are, like, if there was one other thing you could have included, I guess, what would you have included? Well, I mean, you know, like I said, I'm a nerd. I, I think there's been a lot of, um, I didn't really get a chance to do it. I mean, I would have liked to have done it, but we could have done more on the actual attack and what was the all the, the amount of evidence and the, the role by online sleuths who have uncovered all sorts of personalities and people who, you know, committed crimes that day and um, put together a more robust, you know, the committee kind of put out a very, this sort of shell of this this thing I envisioned, which was a model of the attack. Mm -hmm. um, it was supposed to be this interactive thing and it, it kind of was a dud. It really wasn't what I had in mind or would hope we would produce, you know. Mm -hmm. um, could have done a lot more with that, with all the video and all the other content that's out there, sort of building out a chronology that had all this video and had all this content that was publicly available and then sort of filtering it through this interactive model of the Capitol for people to click on and understand things, you know. Yeah. Um, but the core, the core structure of the report is basically how the hearings were laid out, right? I mean, the committee decided this was the way we're going. They were going to structure the the plot, right? The spoken wheel that I talked about earlier, the spoken wheel plot of the whole thing. Here, you know, you have the big lie, you have the pressure on state officials, fake elector scheme, DOJ, Vice President Pence, 187 minutes, you know, the attack, all that stuff, you know, fits into the wheel of the conspiracy. So each chapter in the core of the report deals with one of those spokes, basically, and, mm -hmm. but recognizing that they all, at the end of the day form the same wheel you know yeah the um here's a question it I'm, I'm assuming that the full deposition uh tapes exist is there any plan or will those ever all be released or i have no idea like i don't i don't know what exists or doesn't exist actually yeah. i wouldn't assume anything i mean i think you know i don't know if there was you know you know size constraints for some of this you know with the video and everything i, I have no mm -hmm. idea so okay. i wasn't in I wasn't involved in how in producing materials to the public, so I have no idea what actually occurred. Gotcha. I guess I'm just assuming that because um, I read through a lot of the depositions and then the J6 committee, a lot of those people show up and they're speaking, and I just assumed that that was the spoken part of the actual recorded dep deposition. But maybe it was a re or they brought him back and they asked him the same questions. Maybe, but um, no, I think those are probably clips of the original. You know, yeah. I, I don't, you know, I, again, I'm assuming the, the the full videos are not available for one reason or another. I don't know. I don't know what happened and all that stuff. Yeah. One of the, um, I don't know if you share this frustration, one of the big frustrations in, in getting through a lot of this uh, is you, you brought up the Electoral College, uh, but something I even realized is a lot of the story doesn't really open up until you kind of have, and this sounds so pathetic, but it's to, until you understand about like how the government works. <laughs> right. um, like what it's is an attorney challenge. general? Like what does it mean when somebody's yeah. acting? But once you understand yeah. that, and this is why I wanted to make a video about this so badly, once you understand everything, not only do not only does all of this stuff look insane, you also end up with like, I thought a lot of the characters involved were really cool. The only reason I'm asking about the deposition is because I want to see the full video of Hirschman's deposition. Like that I guy seems to Hirschman. Yeah, I, I, Eric Hirschman is the one, yeah. I mean, he's he, fucking he hilarious. Knows. Yeah, um, no, he's entertaining. Yeah, yeah, and Rosen and Donahue and Engel, like all three of these guys, are also they they're funny well, and I, like they're they're personable. They and, funny, yeah. But you know what? But you talk about Rosen, Engel, and Donahue. Which, mm -hmm. But here's the thing about DOJ. And you talk about DOJ, right? Mm -hmm. This is why this is so important. Yeah, the Department Department of Justice has no constitutional role to play whatsoever in the Electoral College process. Yeah. Okay. It's only if there is some crime that's been committed like a specific instance of fraud or something like that mm -hmm. that needs to be investigated and prosecuted, the DOJ has a role to play. And and Attorney General Barr opened up the books on this very early to allow early investigations to any allegations of, of wrongdoing, right? And by the way, there were a lot of people on the left that criticized him for doing that. I have my own criticisms of Barr, but in this instance, I don't think there was anything wrong in doing that. I think he was trying to basically head off, like get ahead of whatever needed to be investigated. Okay. Mm -hmm. But the bottom line is they didn't find anything, right? There was nothing. There was nothing real. It was like the thing, the myths you talked about earlier with Dominion voting machines, the two hundred five thousand voters in Pennsylvania. You know these types of the state farm. They they investigated. They looked into this stuff. It's all in the chapter on the DOJ, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's in there, which is chapter four, I think, of the report. You know, but it's all nonsense. It's all bullshit, right? As Barr said, Barr said it's all bullshit because it is all bullshit, you know, yeah. and Trump knows this. They say it's all bullshit. But here's the point, right? Under our system, the states play a very uh, have a constitutional role to play in how you certify electors, how the vote is conducted and counted. Right. And then how electors are certified and a, and a victor is declared. Right. The executive branch in our system has zero role to play in that. And it's certainly the Department of Justice has zero role to play in that. What Trump was trying to do was abuse the power of the Department of Justice to interfere in the constitutional processes of other branches of government, government, other parts of the U.S. government. Yeah, so 
this is a huge point, right? Because a lot of people you're, you're talking about who are supposedly constitutional conservatives who are, are mired in, in myths about January 6th and lies about it, right? Well, listen, buddy, you can't be a constitutional conservative if you're in favor of this or you're going to make excuses for this because this is the opposite of constitutional conservatism. This is mm -hmm. trying to shred the Constitution, you know? Yeah, this is this goes back to what I just said about, like, understanding the civics is that when, when I heard that Raffensperger call initially, um, I, like, I'm thinking, like, man, the fact that he was, like, looking for votes and he was, like, doing all this kind of weird, you know, repeating these conspiracies yeah. and that was kind of, you know, that was a bad thing. And then after, because when I started getting steeped in the J6 stuff, now I'm starting to read, like, what is the structure of the DOJ? How does, you know, how are offices and departments created for the executive? I don't know. I had no idea, right? So I'm just reading the Constitution, reading where these things come from. Where, and it's like, okay, now when I look back at the, uh, at like the Raffensperger call, I don't even care that much about the 11,000 vote thing. Why is the, why is a guy running for office calling the Secretary of State? to accuse them of voter stuff and asking for voter role. Like, it's on its face, the phone call, even if he wasn't president, is completely inappropriate. The fact that he yeah, is president right. makes it even right. more inappropriate. Just that call right. is insane just because it exists. And then also exactly. the, I don't know if this was in your guys' report or not, I, I think it was, Donald Trump even called one of the lower investigators. Investigators, yeah, it's in there, yep. Yeah, which is, it's an insane call. I'm so happy yeah. that, I don't know if it was Brad or Ryan who recorded the call that leaked when Donald Trump yep. the next day said, oh, they don't know anything about it, and then he leaked the whole thing. I'm so yep. glad that call was leaked. But um, my God, but yeah. The, but what you, what you just mentioned there, though, that's that's part of why this is so serious. Remember at the outset, we talked about January 6th being the culmination of this going from, you know, really before the election, but certainly from election day onward, right? Mm -hmm. Trump, uh, Trump and his associates do this across the board, across all the swing states. They call executive officials, executive branch officials that have a, a constitutional role in certifying the results of an election, right? Yeah. They call lower level, you know, executives, right? You know, st state and local government officials trying to get anybody they can to obstruct Donald Trump's defeat, right? And mm -hmm. this is this is again, this is an attack on the constitutional order of the first order, you know, the magnitude. And this is why I say when I when I started putting together the report, working with others on it, right? One of the things I, I said was before you even get to the violence, before you even get there, we have a very serious attack on our constitutional order. You know, before you even get to the the, the organized riot, as I call it on January 6th, before you even get there, this is very serious. Because for the first time in our history, we have a president trying to misuse and abuse the power of the, the including the bully pulpit of the presidency to interfere with all these other constitutional duties that officials around the country have to perform. Yeah. And then the collective amnesia. Uh, but accidentally or, or induced to the electorate and intentionally done by the media figures is so frustrating because you ask people about, like, say that the event itself, January 6th, and you're like, you know, well, like, I'll, I'll talk to people and I, there's that there's that one stupid fucking quote from Trump. I know you'll be marching peacefully. And they always say that, like, well, he told them to march peacefully. Like, this is a this came at like 20 minutes in the speech. It was an hour speech of unhinged state, so many unhinged things. But I'm like, OK. He tweeted out that it was going to be a historic event, right? And they're like, well, yeah, I guess. Okay. And it was on January 6th, right? Yeah, okay. What were they protesting? Well, they just were upset. It's like, okay. He sent them all down. He riled them all up. Then there was, uh, you know, a riot. Was that like an accident? And they're like, well, yeah, it was just a coincidence. Yeah, I don't think he, like, he didn't want it. So it was just a coincidence that they all showed up on the day of the certification. They marched down. They fought like hell. They thought the election was stolen. They delayed the certification. That was all a coincidence. They just, and the the collective amnesia over all of it, and, and, or, or I'll ask people questions. Like, my, one that I like a lot is when, when Donald Trump said over and over again that Mike Pence needs to do the right thing. What the fuck was he talking about? What did he mean by that? Do the right thing. What was the right thing? And people are like, well, I, I don't know. I have no idea. It's like, we, yeah. All right. Well, a couple, couple things on this. Let's take, let's take this one thing at a time. So peacefully and patriotically, I wrote a piece at Just Security on this. You can Google it, right? Taking apart this defense. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of the things that the investigative team on the committee found, January 6th committee found, was um, drafts of Trump's speech and how it was crafted for January 6th. And it's true, he does say at one point, very briefly, peacefully and patriotically, right? But that's the only time he says the word peacefully, right? The words don't come from him. They come from his speechwriters, right? And he invokes the word fight at least 20 other occasions in the speech. And the etymology of the speech shows that that is him. Those are That is his words. That is what he's doing, including what is, I think, inarguably the most incendiary line ever spoken by a sitting U.S. president. Uh, in our domestic politics, which is you got to fight like hell. And if you don't fight like hell, we're not going to have a country anymore. Uh -huh. Right. So you're going to tell me that people, you know, the peacefully line somehow trumps the 20 times that he used the word fight in one context or another, including that incendiary line, yeah. which is the most incendiary line you can imagine. And, and by the way, the stuff focused on Pence, 
sending them down to the Capitol, as Barr himself has said, right, was all about intimidating Pence. It was about intimidating his own vice president. That's why he's doing it. There's no reason to march to the Capitol, who at that point, there's only one card left to play. That's yeah. the Pence card, as they called it, right, which is to pressure Pence mm -hmm. to help him overturn the election results. That the whole point of sending the mob down there is to intimidate Pence and Congress into trying to obstruct, at a minimum, obstruct the certification. Again, whether he knows there's going to be any violence or not, or whether he's, you know, you know, directly involved in or blessing any violence or not. The point is he wants his mob to go down to the Capitol to obstruct the certification of the proceeding. They want they want him to intimidate his own vice president into not doing his constitutional duty on January 6th, which is and by the way, anybody who tells you they don't know if Pence what Pence should have done on January 6th, it's there's only two sources for the vice president's power. They're both discussed in the report, right? One is the Twelfth Amendment. There's a single line. Doesn't say anything about any of the stuff that Trump was trying to have the vice president do. And the other one was the Electoral Count Act of 1887 at the time, in which case Trump and his advisors were trying to get Pence to violate it, Yeah, you know, knowingly. So yeah. there's no constitutional or historical or legal precedent or basis for anything they were trying to get Pence to do. And the mob gets sent down to the Capitol purely to try and get him to do something other than his constitutional duty. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That's the thing, too. Like, what do you what were they protesting there? And like, people won't answer that. Right. question. What did they what were they on January 6th during the certification of the vote? Right. I thought because, again, they want to live in every world. I thought that the extra slates were just there in case there was voter fraud discovered. Right. right. Well, there was right. none. Right. They didn't right. win that. Right. And they're like, we just need 10 more days. We just need we just want 10 more right. days. to get Really? Right. Yeah. 10 more days is going to. Yeah, it's. It's very frustrating. Um, By the way, 10 more days would have violated the Electoral Count Act at the time, which had governed that proceeding for 130 years. So, again, every every iteration of what they claim they wanted, uh -huh. right, every single one of them was – would violate either the Constitution or statutory law or a combination thereof. Yeah. So uh, they, had, they had no legal – basis for any of it you know which is also that's it's really frustrating too that you have to dive a bit into like the i don't even want to say it's legalese because it's not super complicated but it's hard to understand i have to explain to people when they say constitutional that's code for breaking the law that's what they mean when they say that anytime they mention the 12th amendment what they're really saying is we have to break the eca the law because of a interpretation that we have of the constitution that as was said by um is it anthony short um or gregory short that short and uh Oh, oh, Mark Short, yeah, Greg, Mark Short. Greg, Greg, Greg Jake, it's Mark Greg Jacobs and Mark Short, yeah. I think it might have been yeah. said by both of them. Yeah, that multiple times Eastman admitted they would lose 2-7, they'd lose 0-9, or that, like, I don't think the court would hear it. It's a major political question thing. They wouldn't hear it, right? They knew that this yeah. was never going to work. So, But you have to tell people that, like, no, no, constitutional doesn't mean that, like, they were following law. Constitutional means they wanted to break the law. <laughs> That's what they were yeah, saying. Actually, it's, actually, it's Orwellian. It's actually the opposite of constitutional. They want to break the Constitution. They want to they want to subsume, they want the vice president to assume unconstitutional powers. I mean, there's a single line of the 12th amendment it's in the report you can look it up online right you have to be completely delusional to think that that single line in the 12th amendment justifies anything they were trying to get pence to do because it doesn't right? yeah. it doesn't it doesn't say anything about any of that so um you know it's it's very it's frightening though that they were able to invent this whole cockamamie scheme based on one line of text in the constitution which by the way eastman and others had admitted previously did not justify <laughs> what yeah, I saw a really good breakdown. Oh, because right. you guys included that as well. Um, right. The email where Eastman breaks down is like, obviously, the vice president doesn't have the power to do this. It would probably fail on right. these levels. And he knew that before right. going in. And then, yeah. he, and then he, and then he, <laughs> but again, it goes back to the problems here, right, of wanting to believe something, you know, mm -hmm. regardless of what the evidence is. Even somebody like this who's supposedly who's supposedly a constitutional lawyer can completely invert what, he's, what he himself knows about all this to justify his beliefs, you know? Yeah. So, okay, so here's a question that I have to, to speak to states of mind. Um, some people involved, I, I would argue, are traitors. Uh, so, and, and, but these people all have impressive backgrounds. Rudy Giuliani, uh, you, you know, uh, the, the RICO guy, New York prosecutor, right? Uh, Sidney Powell. I was Powell, the chief counterterrorism advisor for the OA presidential campaign. <laughs> what, do what? I was I was the chief counterterrorism advisor for Rudy Giuliani for the oh. 2008 presidential campaign. Okay, yeah. I mean, America. So I, I saw him yeah. go from supposedly America's mayor to this drooling imbecile mm -hmm. you know, repeating all sorts of nonsense on behalf of Trump. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, it's unbelievable. It's an unbelievable fall from grace. You know, Sidney Powell, one of the youngest uh, women, uh, I think, uh, federal prosecutors in, in U.S. history. Uh, Eastman was a constitutional lawyer, professor at Chapman. Um, these people have these backgrounds and all the people that got drafted into Trump's team were just insane. But then on the flip side, and this is something that I'm trying to stress so much to people that I talk to, uh, the J6 plot, all of that, it wasn't stopped by progressives. It wasn't stopped by Biden or Kamala or Obama or the left or the Clintons or whatever. 
It was a whole oh. bunch of people that Barr is supposed to be the number one executive power and Trump sycophant. And he stood up to it. And Pence, heroically, stood up to it. And, uh, e, uh, you know, Hirschman and all of these White House staff and lawyers and everything, like, all these guys stood up to it. Why do you think that, like, people like Barr didn't just go along with it? Like, what, what do you think was the major stopping point for a lot of these I'm not, guys? I'm like, not yeah. Miami, right? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, Barr, Barr, was, Barr was certainly, you know— um, very willing to do Trump's bidding up until then. Which yeah, is what makes which is what, which is what makes him unwilling to do it even the more interesting and telling and and credible. I mean, I, I have other criticisms of Barr. There are plenty of other ways you can criticize Barr, but mm -hmm. he clearly stood up in that moment to what Trump was the nonsense Trump was trying to do. And he and he says, you know, he even says on the record with the committee, he says, you know, I I don't think that uh, you know any administration should try and stay in power based on lies about the about the election, you know. Mm -hmm. So he knows how he knows that even though he now he's backpedaled and he says he's going to vote for Trump and all this other stuff, he knows how dangerous this all is, right? I mean, he has to be. He, he lived it. I mean, he resi he resigned in like large two part weeks before the election. Yeah, fourteenth. Yeah, yeah, he issues his letter on just you know, and he in December fourteenth was you know he so twenty twenty. So the, the bottom line is you know, but there's an important point here too to to, to zoom out of all this. So. The, the backbone of the narrative, I mean, there are some Democrats involved. There are some local election workers involved who are not Republicans, uh -huh. like, you know, Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss in Georgia who are smeared with these racist smears, you know, in State Farm Arena. You know, there's, there's people like that, obviously, who are, who are their lives are upended by Trump and his, his bullying, right? But the backbone of this are Republican officials from the federal government all the way down to the local governments who would say no. They stand up to Trump in his attempt to overturn the election, right? But here's the thing. What does Trump do? He systematically attacks using the bully pope of the presidency, each and every one of them, including yeah. his own vice president, right? Folks, that's the definition of autocracy. You know, he's putting the auto in autocracy, yeah. right? Because it is, at the end of the day, only about one, right? His own vice president throws him under the bus. His own attorney general throws him under the bus. You know, you can go through all these different other Republicans all the way down. People who work to try and get him elected and reelected, you know, people who were on his side through election day 2020, people who tried to get him elected and wanted him to stay in office and disappoint in election. He throws them all under the bus and attacks them. He uses the bully pulpit to turn his mob against them, you know, mm -hmm. and that's really dangerous. You know, that's very dangerous. Yeah, he does. It's a it's a thing that there are a million things to point out, but it's just something that you notice as a trend through all of his speeches up through even January 6th is when people play ball with him, he calls them out and he says, like, this guy is such a great congressman. We, you know, we support there are the 11 senators and then. I think Jim yep. Jordan or whatever, the, the the worst person in the history of the House. Um, the, these people that are, he's always giving credit to, he's always calling out. And when people don't play ball, he's always right. saying this, you know, I think for Brian Kemp, he called him a schmuck on the phone. Uh, you know, these guys that we get elected and they're not loyal to us and they don't help. And it's like, Jesus, like, how is yeah. it not so transparent what's going on here? Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, the, the evidence, the, the evidence part of the, the big part of the January 6th case, including the federal case brought by special counsel, you can see that there's this whole pattern of behavior. Again, you know, reposting information that really puts paints targets on these official officials backs all the way across all the swing states. And then, of course, leading up to Vice President Pence himself repeatedly, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's also another, by the way, another rebuttal to the, Trump's behavior during the attack or immediately proceeding with the attack and then during the attack. The first actual tweet that he puts out is a 224 where he attacks Vice President Pence right in the middle of the attack. Failed he says, doesn't, have the doesn't have the courage to do what was necessary, right? The stuff that comes after that, yeah, he does say stuff about, you know, stay peaceful, that kind of thing after that, right? But it's not him, right? It's his advisors and his daughter and everybody else putting words in his mouth and trying him. Now he does tweet out some of the stuff, but um, but the point is like the first, the first um, – blush at it the first attack at it from him the first the first instance of him in his own words is always the most aggressive the most you know uh zealous the most you know trying to rile people up you mm -hmm. know? and i think i have to go back and check the times but i think that isn't that stay peaceful tweet that might come like minutes after i think ashley babbitt was already shot um i'd have to look on the timing on that but yeah, yeah. I mean, basically if people are trying desperately to you know i mean he and by the way he he you know he keeps holding ashley babbitt up as a martyr for the cause and it is tragic that mm -hmm. she was shot killed on January 6th. It's awful, right? Um, but she was shot climbing through a window, you know, just feet away from members of Congress and others, right? When mm -hmm. trying to leave, you know, at the forefront of this mob that's trying to go through. It's awful that she was shot and killed. It's tragic. It's also tragic that she believed all this QAnon nonsense that, that Trump endorsed, you yeah. know? You know, I mean, Trump as, as president is given multiple opportunities to knock down the QAnon conspiracy theory, right? And he doesn't, you know? He does the opposite. He actually validates the core beliefs of QAnon. You know, mm -hmm. he's asked at one point right from the, the podium, you know, he says, they say, you know, um, you know, do you, what do you think about these people who think you're, you're trying to head off this 
the satanic cult of pedophiles of Democrats and others like that. And, he's, and he says, well, would it be such a bad thing if that's what I was doing? You know, I mean, it's like this is crazy stuff, you know, but he but the thing here's the thing, right, that I want to get across to anybody who's watching this. Right? Think about how dangerous it is for a president of the United States to validate the craziest shit you see online. Right. Because that's what this guy does. Mm -hmm. And he does it over and over again. You know, and now this isn't just some guy out there. That Savannah Guthrie said during an interview with him, this isn't your uncle, right? This isn't your crazy uncle doing this. This is the president of the United States saying this nonsense that's percolating online that's dangerous. That stuff's legitimate, you know? And so that's that's a big part of the problem, I would say. Yeah, listening to Short talk about how I think he was getting emails, um, or actually, wait, this might have been, it might have been Rosen too, getting emails about like, I need you to like look into this. And it's like the Italian guy talking about yeah. the satellites Satellite, flipping yeah. votes. And it's like, Jesus Christ. Um, it's dumb, right? I mean, it's really dumb stuff. I yeah. Mean, it's really stupid. You know, man, that's the other thing people aren't supposed to say, but I'll say it. You know, this is really stupid. It stuff, is stupid. Right? Yes. It's stupid. It's stupid, right? People won't say that, but you have to say that, right? Because it is dumb, right? Mm -hmm. This is this is an insult to the intelligence of anybody who has any kind of intellect. You know, this is really, really dumb stuff. You know, mm -hmm. so yeah, even like all the Ruby Freeman and Shamas stuff, like they like they did all of this rigging, all this conspiratorial stuff. Why the fuck did they give you the tapes then? Because the, another thing that I wish people would realize sometimes is when they allege stuff. It happens a lot with conspiracies, right? Sometimes people will allege what would be the largest conspiracy in the history of the country, right? The idea that somebody is with top-down coordination rigging elections across several states, that would probably be one of the largest conspiracies and most impactful conspiracies, maybe right. in all of world history, in all of human right. history, and the evidence is non-existent, right? You're alleging something so grand, right? If this was the case, right? If the Clintons are killing people like Seth Rich and protecting Jeffrey Epstein and all this, why are they giving you the fucking tapes? Why would why would the State Farm right. Arena tapes be visible? You right. don't think they would take care of the fucking security cameras in the corner of the room, <laughs> right? Right. right. Or people, well, or, yeah. But, you, but, there, but there's an old logical principle that that's very well known. That's been known for thousands of years. That you're just you're 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 extrapolating on there, which is extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, right? Oh, I've changed that now. I just say extraordinary claims require at least any evidence, any evidence at all. Gonna, Give me one I, thing. I was just gonna follow, I was gonna follow up with saying these extraordinary claims require just a scintilla of evidence. Yeah. Anything whatsoever. Yeah, I was, I was gonna, yeah, exactly. I mean, but that's the point, right? They're building these sand ca these monumental sandcastles on uh, not even a grain of sand, you know, mm -hmm. and, and that's a real big problem, you know, because and that's, and that's why it doesn't even qualify as conspiracy theories, right? This is just rabid conspiracism, you know? Yeah, because they can just lie with impunity over anything and just keep repeating it over and over and over again. People just like believe it, even though, like I said, a lot of these were debunked like the day of, like the Dominion right. stuff was, that's another thing I'll do now when I'm on stage, like, oh, you think Dominion was right? Go ahead and say that, right? Because the, the content creators know right. that they got sued right. and they know that they won't say it. It's like, oh, okay. Um, right. Yeah, or Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss won 100, uh, 148 million, I think, from Giuliani. And that was another thing Owen Schreier said. He's like, yeah, the, the, the ballots were ran three times in Georgia. I was like, oh, who, who ran those? Will you say who ran it? He's like, well, it, it wasn't Ruby or Shea. It was somebody else. Like, oh, okay, we're changing the names now. Um, I mean, yeah, again, you have, you have, you, I, don't, I don't even know if patience is the right word. Cause I could, like somebody like that, I don't think I could, you know, debate in good faith. I mean, I think that, per, that, that type of stuff is just so dishonest. Yeah. And, and so. But half the yeah. electorate, like, my guess would be I, again, I over 80% of Republicans probably believe the State Farm video. I'm sure there are liberals that even think the State Farm video maybe is real or hard yeah, to explain. I mean, all, 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 the, all the data you know, shows that the, the Republicans are much more willing to believe this stuff than, than liberals or Democrats for sure at this point. And again, I think that's because Trump, who was president of the United States, and his minions said it was legit, said it was true, right? I mean, it's, again, this is the power of the presidency. You know, It's not coming from – your crazy uncle it's coming from a guy who was president of the united states is telling you that this all the stuff is going on mm -hmm. you know that's why it's that's why it's so dangerous yeah that's why it's so dangerous if he, that's why it's so dangerous if two weeks from today he you know or shortly thereafter he wins the election in my view because then this broken reality that he and his followers live in gets enshrined as truth you know yeah that's one of the biggest things when people say like well what's the worst thing that could happen if trump is elected and to some extent it's like a referendum on what what conduct you're allowed to get away with like why would you ever waste your time being truthful or about anything right if this is the reward for it um so you said that you were involved in the drafting of the report but none of the live like presentation in congress right no i didn't say that no no oh okay wait was there uh, i was i was involved in in you were asking about like the um where the, the deposition yeah I, I don't know where any of that stuff i don't i didn't have any i didn't have any role in producing stuff online as the committee was like shutting down and stuff. i didn't have any role in any of that but in terms of the hearings i absolutely had a role in the hearings yeah oh okay were you happy yeah. with how the um the the like the video the 
the presentation turned out compared to like the written report? Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I'm proud of the work the committee did. There's obviously a lot of people involved. I mean, obviously, I'm just one one person, so there's a lot of people involved. But yeah, I'm very happy with it. I mean, there's definitely, you know, things that always could be better or go better. I mean, you know, I'm a, I'm a nerd, so I, you sure. know, I, I go back and read my own stuff and kind of think it could be better, you know, at times. So, um, but um, yeah, no, I mean, I think the, the the hearings conveyed what they needed to convey. You mm -hmm. know, it's a very Again, there's a lot going on here. There's a lot of evidence and trying to boil that down and synthesize it and get people to pay attention, understand, you know. Um, but, you know, to me, I, I looked at it as, you know, if you're a constitutional conservative out there, how can you possibly think that any of this is kosher, right? How can you possibly think that anything you're, you're, you're seeing here is legitimate? Because none of it is, yeah. you know. So what what do you think caused or why do you think it was so hard for Americans to be persuaded by this? Or have you ever in your personal life uh, seen a conservative and argued any of these points and moved them on anything like, it, it, yeah, what do you or what is like the most convincing or compelling thing when you're talking to people for, for this stuff that, that don't agree with it coming in? Or is there any answer? To <laughs> I, there's, I don't have a good answer. I mean, you mentioned your family members earlier. I have family members, too. I won't you mm -hmm. know, identify, but I have family members, friends, longtime colleagues who you know, people who believe all sorts of bullshit, you know, and they're not, you know, they're not stupid people. And yet they believe stuff that's really dumb, mm -hmm. you know, and it's very, it's very hard to, to, to accept that and figure out a way around it. You know, I mean, I could, you could sit down and show them something. And what I say, what I say is even if they concede that point, they'll just move on to the next lie, the next thing to, to justify the original belief. Right. Mm -hmm. And it just shows, it just shows how fragile the human mind really is and that the human mind is really, um, if if a person wants to believe something, he or she will believe it, you know? And this is also what's so dangerous about bad leadership though, right? Because humans do need decent leaders, people who are willing to guide them and put the productive passion, their passions into something that's productive and is a better outcome for all of us, right? Mm -hmm. um, and when you have somebody who abuses their authority and their power to lead them down these dark paths and these dark roads, this is the outcome, right? And that's why you have people who believe stuff like they do today about the 2020 election, you know? What do you think, um, for, for the current information environment that we exist in, do you have any ideas personally about like what you would like to see changed or any kind of like path forward? Because it seems like it's unsustainable right now, or at least not with America as being a, a country <laughs> for much longer. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. I'm not going to claim to have the answers. You know, I mean, I, you know, I, a mutual friend of mine opened me up to what you're doing, you know, and to what some other people are doing in terms of these debates or anything. I think that's great. You have, again, you have more patience than I do in terms of the people you debate because you know, I definitely would have a hard time not insulting them, you know, from how stupid, how stupid this stuff is you, you hear and you see, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I don't know what the path forward is. I mean, I, I do think there's, you know, an educational component. You know, I do think people have to kind of be better educated and understand these things. I think, I think that there needs to be a better um, sort of consensus building for people who are opposed to this type of stuff, mm -hmm. you know, better coalition building. You know, people need to say, OK, you know, we can disagree on X, Y and Z, but this is sort of a core thing here. Right. This is the core of our democracy and how it's going to function. And we need to expand that coalition as broad as possible to hold the line against people who really are so rabid in their beliefs that they would undermine it. You know, mm -hmm. I think that's one of my one of the scariest things to me is um the, the there are it feels like there are core American things right now that we're not all aligning on in like very troubling ways. Like mm -hmm. um, uh, again, I don't know your positions on it, but I, I would argue that a lot of our involvement in the Middle East, especially when it came to Iraq, um, I'm sure you could justify some initial invasions or attacks like in Afghanistan or you're getting Osama bin Laden, you know. Um, but the after 9/11, at the very least. It was a, like, hold on, okay, let's stop fighting for a second. Whoever the fuck George Bush tells us to go after, we will attack any country on the planet. We are united as fuck. We just got hit. This is bullshit, right? I genuinely feel like today, and maybe I'm wrong, I hope I'm wrong, but I feel like today if we were attacked by somebody, I don't even know if the United States would be united in its response. Yeah, I don't I've know. I've thought that many times, mm -hmm. yep. Um, what, what do you, what in your in, in interpretation of things, what do you think is the thing that's changed the most, I guess, over the past, like, 20 or 30 years? social media in the online world, you know, because now what, what happens is that herding is a human thing. It's a human phenomenon, just like it is for other animals. But it, it often happens either it can happen with a mob like mm -hmm. you saw on January 6th, or it can happen in terms of herding of opinion, you know. And, you know, I was um, so I was originally an economist and our sister company 
much of our sister company uh, was wiped out on 9-11. And so my mind sort of turned from these economic projects that I was working on, research projects, to counterterrorism. That's how I originally got involved. And like I said, eventually I ended up being, you know, counterterrorism advisor to Mayor Giuliani for his 2008 campaign and, you know, running in those types of circles and advising people on this and built a career in the counterterrorism world, you know. And, um, you know, you think about like the 9-11 um, conspiracy theories, 9-11 trutherism, you know. I mean, I remember back then, I mean, I'm 48 years old. I remember, you know, as a young man back on two, in 2001 and the years after that, 9-11 trutherism was very much marginalized. You know, that people, it didn't really spread in a way that was sort of dangerous for the for our, our, our political body. It didn't really captivate as many people as it could. Mm -hmm. And I look at the trajectory of somebody like Alex Jones, who made, you know, one of the big bumps in his career was 9-11 trutherism, right? He did get a bump on that online, but he was still marginalized and was still kept to sort of his corner, right? And now today you flash forward and Alex Jones is being celebrated across the MAGA right as some sort of brave truth teller, you know? Um, that to me, that transformation from somebody and a belief system that should have been marginalized and should remain marginalized to something that could, um, you know, and, and by the way, that's entirely tied into January 6th and riling up the crowd, before January 6th, on January 6th, and all the lies involved there. That to me is is really disheartening and is really dangerous. And I don't know, I don't know totally how to combat it. I don't know how to how to put I don't know that it can be put back in its box entirely. You yeah. Know? I know that if Trump is reelected, I think then the 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 freaks are gonna fly their flags forevermore. You know, that, that type of stuff is gonna basically be um endorse ever more and you said you know you don't know what the incentive is to be honest or truthful or to do it the right way that to me is a nerd it's really that that hurts right because that's that's i've thought that many many times like wh why am i bothering to spend all this time trying to get the quote precisely correct or do this or that when you can have this type of idiotic nonsense gain mm -hmm. traction you know yeah so, i had um i had a guy that i was debating who was a. Uh, I think he worked on I don't think it was InfoWars. I think it was, I think it was part of Tim Pool's crowd or whatever. And you know, he was denying. You know, he's there is no evidence that you know the Proud Boys were even involved. And there's no evidence. And if they were involved, they did much. Like, okay, let's read through the entire Enrique Tarrio indictment. Let's just read through the indictment, and, and you know, you tell me if this seems bad or not, right? And we're going through. We, we you know, we're like a third of the way through. And it's like, okay, they're just talking. It's not that big of a deal. It's like, okay, well, they, you know, they want to go to the event. That's fine. And they get. And then by the time we hit the end, he's like. He, he th th I'm not joking when I say this. Okay, this isn't a joke. This is a real story. This YouTube video is on my channel. He's like, I fooled you. And I was like, what do you mean you fooled me? And he's like, Enrique Tario is a federal informant and this whole thing is fake. <laughs> and I'm like, well, fuck me, I guess. Okay, so we just wasted an hour reading this because you realize it's indefensible. And now it's a, oh, he was a fed the entire time. Um, holy Christ. Yeah. And it's like, Jesus. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, that's why he was convicted of seditious conspiracy and other felonies and sentenced to 22 years in prison, right? I mean, so if he was just a federal informant, you don't think he would have gotten off with, you know, what he did and what he was saying. Because that's why Ray Epps got off, remember? Ray Epps wasn't right. charged initially because no, he, he was a federal informant, but and then, then he was, was charged was, yeah, yeah, to cover it up. And yeah, right. and it's like... <sighs> yeah, I mean, it's it's all... I mean, this is the bottom line for me. I know I keep saying this, I keep repeating it, but I, mm -hmm. I can't help it, right? Because I, I feel like I'm in this venue, I can kind of be a little more unleashed, right? This is all stupid stuff. Yeah. Really, really dumb, you know? And... This is what happens when you have a herd of stupid people believe something and you can't convince them otherwise, right? So I don't know. I don't know how you combat that, you know. Uh -huh. um, you know, again, you Rudy Giuliani, who you know, I, who, again, who I worked for briefly on this campaign. He went from being America's mayor, Amer supposed mayor, in the response to 9/11 to you can find clips of him entertaining 9/11 trutherism now, online. You know, yeah. I mean, how, how do you, how do you square that one? You know, I mean, yeah, it's insane. And even you brought up the Steve Bannon transformation, and I I do think that's one of the scarier things for for being part of uh or I'm not I'm sorry not Bannon um Alex Jones, um mm -hmm. one of the scarier transformations to me even has been I don't know how much you keep up with them is Tucker Carlson, who yeah. no I've got a whole I've got a whole I wrote a piece about Tucker Carlson on January six I wrote it for Politico about how what he was doing with his audience with the footage he was getting for January six mm -hmm. and just. Just debunking it, you know. I mean, I was one of the ones who, when it came to the January sixth surveillance footage, I mean, I always said put it all out there. You yeah. know, I, I I watched a lot of it. Put it all out there. I don't I don't care. You know, there's nothing. There's no deep dark secret hidden there. Put everything out. I mean, what what does it matter? You know. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, he 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 he's somebody who manipulates his audience. He's a good example of a guy. You, I could take you through, you know, his documentary Patriot Purge, for example, where he's trying to he you know he and li there's literally a clip where he's talking about, you know agent provocateurs or deep state provocateurs or something like that. He's trying to, to blame this on some mythical non-existent people, right? Mm -hmm. And literally on the screen are Proud Boys clearing away the security fences, right? You can see who the provocateurs are. Yeah. You know, 
on the screen as he's trying to blame somebody else. You know, if you just know that you're looking at William Pepe and a couple of his friends there, you know, who, uh-huh. who were proud boys, if you knew who they were, you know exactly what what he was what actually was going on. And that type of thing is very, you know, the people who watch him, who watch that and watch and he, as he goes through his fall for fall from grace and who want to believe that stuff. I don't know how you get through to them. I really don't because they're just so rabid in their beliefs. You know? Yeah. It was one of the funniest things. I thought I was going to spend a lot of time trying to like find coverage, like who said you know favorable things about the J six stuff as it was happening. And I tuned in and I watched the whole day's worth of Infowars stuff, and it was so crazy. There are so many funny quotes. Well, I say funny in a very dark way, but it was like uh, like the the guy, the host talking is literally saying like you can see these proud patriots walking down the street. This is an Antifa. These are patriots. Like we know that these are patriots. Um, Ashley Babbitt gets shot and killed, and it's a uh, th- this is a uh, this is the first victim of the second American Revolution. Yeah. Uh, and then the National Guard shows up, and about 20 minutes later, it's like, well, there was a lot of Antifa there. We're not actually sure. Like, And it's like, the you watch the narrative. It's the 1984 thing. We're at war with whoever, and then it changes mid-speech, like in real yeah. time. And I'm like, wait, what? There's no way. Um, yeah. yeah. Can I? Can again, I? Again, oh, go this, ahead. This, yeah. this, I'm sorry. I was just saying, this, ty- this type of thing, though, what you're describing, that phenomenon, you know, in the pre-social media, pre online days where it was sort of limited you, this type of phenomenon wouldn't be able to grow as fast as it does there's always been conspiracism there's always been crazy beliefs and irrationality and and always been nonsense right i mean you can go through the history of america right you can you can point to all sorts of hurting of crazy stuff but mm-hmm. the point is now i think it, it mushrooms much faster than it ever has in the past and it, it, it's much more vehement you know yeah, unfortunately, yeah. And then the, the, it's impossible to keep up with the fact-checking on everything because there's so many new right. things. Every single day, it's another new thing. Exactly. Um, am I? Can I ask you a couple questions related to counterterrorism stuff? Sure. sure. Cool. Sure. Um, do you have any final thoughts or anything on the J6 stuff before I hop over to this? Or No, ask me anything you want. I don't care. I don't know if you have anybody typing in questions to or anything. It's fine. You know, if you want to ask me whatever. Okay, yeah. I might, yeah, I might grab some of them. Yeah. Um, Oh, I, I will hint, or I will say real quick, because a guy wanted me to debate the 9-11 stuff, and I was like, you know what, fuck it, let's do it. Um, there were always things about the official story where I was like, oh, maybe I can kind of see, you know, maybe, who knows. Um, and I, uh, there's a, a, a movie called The New Pearl Harbor. Have you ever heard of this? I don't know if I've heard of that It's one. like a six-hour 9-11 truth or video. I, I, I'm sure you've heard of Loose Change, right? Or do you remember that? Yes. The, the original one, yeah. Uh, I will say, going through that, the new Pearl Harbor, that six-hour video, and then reading, like, the NTSB, uh, like, report and everything, I have never been a more official believer, uh, more more of a bigger believer in the official story until after reading through all of the documentation and everything because there's stuff where and i didn't even realize like sometimes I'll, I'll think a thing and i don't realize how dumb it is like there are parts where like they're finding passports after the planes have crashed and i'm thinking like jesus like what the fuck is the chance of that and like there's no way right and then i'm thinking like well i don't know what is the chance of that? i don't how many fucking planes crash i don't know what it looks like and then you can find all these other examples of like well planes crash and papers fly out and it's like oh okay maybe this you know it does happen or whatever more commonly than i would have thought um yeah, there's just so much of that. Um, oh, yeah, running through that nine eleven video was just funny. You know, uh, I built the whole. I built the whole. I mean, I built the whole career in the counterterrorism world. I mean, I did some uh, interesting stuff. I mean, I got the CIA to release Bin Laden's files in 2017. Mm-hmm. I did uh, work with Republican congressmen and others to do that. I did all sorts of analysis on those files. I did. You know, we we were famous. We kind of made our bones doing a lot of analysis of the war in Afghanistan. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you one of the things about my career that's a real, real weird thing, real weird dynamic for me. Everything we've just been talking about on January 6th comes from like this anti-establishment sort of anti-authority, you know, right wing anti-government perspective. Right. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, for me, I've actually been critical of a lot of people in government and the elite for so many years, for so many reasons, including on the war in Afghanistan or the war in Iraq or this or that. I mean, I have my own unique set of criticisms. They're not necessarily what anybody else has. But, um, you know, I've been very critical of the powers that be over and over again. And yet I find this whole belief system to be so dangerous and so toxic, right? And so corrosive for our politics and our democracy because it's not being used to um, make things better or get better leadership. It's doing the opposite, you know? Yeah, that's always my biggest criticism of misinformation about any particular thing is that it causes people to because we have to give so much air now to the bullshit, there are things that we genuinely miss um, that that we don't get to address now. Uh, like when it came to the FISA warrants and the FBI's investigation into Trump and everything, this idea of there being a top-down conspiracy across all departments is like, if you know anything about it, it's just, it's just no possible way. But 
it could be. Um, and I, I think kind of I, maybe I agree. Um, I think it was Dunham that did the FBI thing that the end line that basically there can exist a culture politically where people can feel a certain way and it can lead to biases in departments where, you know, there's there we need to have like uh, like red teams on certain issues. I'm like, OK, yeah, this makes sense. I could totally see how this could happen. But you don't even get to have any of those conversations publicly because instead it's like, how do we figure out who like the deep state alien lizard is rather than how do we counter, you know, what could develop as a natural bias, you know, in departments? It's very yeah. frustrating. Yeah, I mean, there are things, there are things that happen with the, the Trump-Russia stuff, the investigation stuff that I don't agree with. I mean, mm -hmm. there's stuff I think is wrong, you know what I mean? I, but by the same time, the, the, the way I put it is the American right has basically built that into this force field around the Death Star, right? So now anything, anytime they fire off a photon beam, whatever, destroying a planet with their lies, they just claim, well, Russia, 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 you can't attack us, right? We were immune from any kind of retaliation, mm -hmm. you know? And by the way, I mean, you know, the evidence is clear, including Republicans knew this at one point in time that Russia did interfere in the 2016 election. They did orchestrate this hack and leak, Russian intelligence did, of, of DNC's emails. And, and Roger Stone was communicating with, yeah. Yeah, but even, even putting that aside, I mean, the point is that Russia did interfere on Trump's side, you mm -hmm. know? Doesn't mean he colluded necessarily or whatever. They, they try and focus on the word collusion, right? Well, yeah. we have to use that word to have a whole damning body of facts about what actually happened in, in, in 2016, you know? Um, so. You know, but the, but the point is, to your point, you can't have a rational conversation about any of that because it's been so mythologized. You have to crack through, you know, the Himalayan mountain layer of mythology to get to the actual core facts, you mm -hmm. know, so on the or, nine eleven or the nine eleven wars or whatever, you, you mm -hmm. know, whatever you mean. On the so on the counter -ter terrorism stuff, um, I've spent uh, before the J six stuff, I've spent a, a long time doing um, kind of like Israel, Palestine um, I'll say specific to that, or kind of Middle East, because if you do history of Israel and their current issues, you tangentially kind of understand some of things going on in other countries around it. Um, do, how do you feel about, I guess, how the, I guess, I'll say like maybe the young American left or the online communities now, uh, maybe this isn't your perception, but they kind of seem to glorify a little bit. Uh, people like Sinwar, uh, you know, organizations like Hezbollah or Hamas or the Houthis or Iran. Do you, do you see that as being a significant problem or do you think it's a thing that happens as much as my perception of it is? I, I perceive it to be quite a big problem. Um, yeah, I mean, I've definitely seen that. You know, I mean, you can you can you can criticize, for example, um, Israel's conduct of the war and the response to October 7th and say that certain things are doing are wrong and they're killing too many people and they're killing too many civilians and, you know, they're, they're doing this or that wrong. I mean, you should be able to have those criticisms for sure. You can criticize Netanyahu, you know, I don't, I'm mm -hmm. not a fan of Netanyahu, right? But again, this goes to the cognitive problems of humanity. This is sort of the same dynamic we saw during the Cold War, you know, where you had certain people on the left who would not just be critical of the Vietnam War, which is fine. I'm critical of the Vietnam War. You know, it was, it was disastrous, just as the Iraq War was, although more more so even than the Iraq War. You know, but that's that's different from between doing that and then openly sympathizing with the North Vietnamese or China or something like that, right? Which is there's you know you do see this dynamic where people sort of um, are drawn into being sympathetic for like. Sinwar, like you said, or Hamas or Hezbollah. And these are these are violent, vile um, organizations, you know, that I mean, before you even get into the terrorist label, which is entirely accurate, right? Just get into their ideological beliefs. You know, what they actually believe is totally inconsistent with anybody progressive left and what they believe should be going on in America. You know, the way they think that society should be structured and organized and who should have rights and who should not have rights, right, is completely inconsistent with what a progressive left person should believe in the country in the US, you know, or does believe in the US, you know, and so I always marvel at that same type of contradiction you see with like, conservative constitutional conservatives when it comes to Trump and Trumpism in January six, where you have this guy in this movement who are clearly trying to shred the Constitution. And yet they on behalf of their fealty for the Constitution, they say they need Trump, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't make any sense. It's cognitive dissonance. It's the same type of thing you can see here. There's a cognitive dissonance between you supposedly believe in these progressive ideals and yet you're willing to sympathize with people who are at least a part of them, I'm not saying all of them, just part of them. There's an online young audience online that, that has that sort of proclivity. And it, it is uh, disheartening and problematic. When you think of um, um, when you think of counterterrorism, when we think of terrorism, usually we think of like kinetic like uh, attacks or some type of physical infiltration. Um, do you spend any time kind of like studying or researching how the information landscape is is so at risk or under attack, especially by, I guess, like Qatar or um, Iran or Russia, especially? Um, yeah, I've spent a lot of time on that. Um, so. There was, you know, one of the things from doing all the work, I did a lot of work on Afghanistan. Uh -huh. um, 
And um, one of the things that I um, came to really study very closely were the Akani's, the Akani Network, the Akani family. I'm sure you've heard of them. They're big wigs within the Taliban. Okay. Um, and not only the big wigs within the Taliban, but the Akani's really incubated Al Qaeda in South Asia, in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Without without the Akani's, arguably, you don't get Al Qaeda. OK, um, for a lot of reasons. And by the way, if you want to talk about questioning the official narrative of things, 9-11 Commission Report, you can download the PDF and look for it. You won't find a single mention of Jalaluddin Haqqani, who was the first benefactor for Osama bin Laden. You know, and, and if you want to get into conspiracy <laughs> reasons why, right, it may be because he worked with the CIA, you know. Uh-huh. And so there are some times where you can criticize government agencies and there's maybe something to it, you know. Um, and But – uh, but in any event, so I, I've studied the economies very carefully, and, and we talk about disinformation, information landscape. New York Times ran an op-ed that was ostensibly authored by Sir Juden Akani, the titular head of the Akani Network. This guy was very, very important and powerful, and it was a complete snow job. It was a complete whitewash. It was, it was obviously disinformation, right? And they ran it uncritically as if you know it was legitimate and it was obvious somebody wrote it for him and it was obvious he had somebody you know ghost write for him to and appeal to sort of a left-wing audience in the u.s and try and appeal to those sensibilities in a way and it was all nonsense you know and so it's very easy in this information environment for somebody like that by the way a guy who was a u.s designated terrorist a guy who trained and dispatched suicide bombers a guy who sheltered senior al-qaeda members a guy who's mentioned in Osama bin Laden's files as one of Osama bin Laden's guys, right, in the region, and, and that they're relying on and working with. Okay, that guy gets an op-ed in the New York Times that is a complete snow job. You know, so yeah, I mean, I, I dealt with this a long time. You, you have all sorts of ability of actors to influence information and beliefs inside our democracy, and it's uh, scary. It's scary mm-hmm. stuff. You know? I think that um, in in the past, having those types of um, having those types of hits done required more like, I guess, like uh, ability to infiltrate or more sophistication to infiltrate. Not to say that the attacks that exist today on our landscape aren't sophisticated, but it's very frustrating to see how effective and easy it is with, um, I don't know, do you, do you have feelings about like, I guess, Elon Musk's possession of X and the amount of stuff that flies over that network? It just seems like a like an actual dream oh, of yeah, a landscape to, to just proliferate the it, it, bad information to the minds of Americans. And yeah, I mean, free. he's turned it into an Infowars style channel. I mean, you know, I talk about the influence of Alex Jones. I mean, Elon Musk is the wealthiest guy on the planet, right? And he, one of the first things he did was he let Alex Jones back on X, which was formerly Twitter. And then he, I mean, one of the first things he did after that was have a Twitter space with him, X space with him, right? Where he actually, think about that. The wealthiest guy in the world, right, decides to take the time to join a social media space and converse with and whitewash Alec Jones's career, which is what he did during that performance. I mean, that's scary stuff, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and X, X is, I've always been, I I think I first posted on X in April 2014 when it was Twitter. Mm-hmm. Um, I was always skeptical of it as a platform. I'm, I've always been, had a lot of trepidation about social media. Um, I, I, somebody who studied the rise of ISIS very carefully, I know for a fact that social media played a big role in that. You know, um, so I've seen a lot of the harm that social media does in particular, but it's gotten worse over time, and it's it's sort of at at, at its peak of horrible now. Yeah. You know. Um. <clears throat> yeah. The um. I guess broadly speaking, I feel like uh one of the one of the things that is hurting the most is uh the 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 factual worlds that we inhabit are, are becoming more and more distant from each other, and I feel like it's. I know that people have always complained, like, oh, it's the worst it's ever been. And I, like, that's just a thing growing up. Like, everybody says it always. But I feel like we're truly reaching points where we're, we're well, I think we've already passed the threshold where we're starting to see real world impacts. Like, mm-hmm. maybe somebody believes before 9 11 was a conspiracy. Okay. I mean, like, it's bad. You shouldn't believe it. And, you know, maybe there's some increase in anti Semitism online or whatever. But, like, at the end of the day, it's not like playing out in a huge way. Right. But now you have people who are like rejecting like help from FEMA. Right. Because they think that they're also going to repo their house. Um, You've got like bills in in Congress that are stalling or dying relating to supporting Ukraine uh, because people think that, you know, Azov and bioweapons and everything, um, you know, the support for Israel and, and, you know, whatever other countries, whatever, regardless of the position that you're on any of these things. 
it feels like we're truly reaching a, a point to where other people on the planet are having a significant influence over our internal political conversations. And in my mind, the party that was the most equipped to deal with that, like I, I think that progressives suck because they could deal with racism, but they would never call out like brown people or black people for being racist, only white people. Well, conservatives were our like conspiracy bunch. And if a foreign country was trying to mess with us, you better believe the conservative conspiracy with her. But like you said earlier about the Russia gate, if you talk to a conservative today and you say like, do you think Russia tries to meddle with our elections? The answer is no more than America tries to meddle with anyone else right, right? right and it's like well right. fuck we're like defenseless right. right well that's that moral equivalency there that's what you're talking about there you know between us and russia and the kremlin you know i mean it's you know i mean it, i don't have a very i don't have a hopeful message you know i always feel like debbie downer talking about this stuff because i don't i don't know what the path forward is i mean you talking about you said the, you know people in the past always said well things were the worst in the past you know in my time isn't that that's true but i for me throughout my adult professional life I've seen issues I care about and I've studied very closely. I've seen um, opinion hurt itself in a, in a crazy, dangerous way and then go right off the cliff, you know, like 9-11 trutherism, like January 6th stuff, like just fundamental belief in our democracy, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I mean, you have you have a whole political party that's supposed to be founded in constitutional conservatism, the party of Lincoln. And, you know, they, they've got some warped now views on all this, you know, that, that are – that are actually antithetical to constitutional conservatism. You know, when you see that kind of inversion, right, that kind of moral and intellectual inversion, I don't know how you come back from it. I just don't, you know, and I, I see it everywhere. So it's it's uh, very problematic. Yeah. Did you did you have any strong thoughts on the, did you see the Tenet Media story that came out that there was a... I saw it, yeah. I mean, I mean, it, it, that's evidence of your point, you know, about how, how easy it is, right? It's not, I mean, but again, like, you know, I looked at that. First thing I thought was, you know, what was the pay that like Tim Pool was getting? Like 4, five 000? million over a year, four hundred thousand. I mean, yeah. holy shit! You know, I mean, like that—that that makes me, you know, question my whole professional career, right? Yeah. Because I'm not making that, you know, and I've never made anywhere close to that. And I, I'm toiling away trying to assemble, you know, carefully assemble the facts the best I can. And then this guy who just pontificates with a bunch of nonsense is getting paid big bucks. But then, it, then it makes sense where it's coming from, right? It's, it's a uh, you know, it's coming from a foreign adversary who wants to stir things up. Yeah. Know? So it's very frustrating that not, not to say that there aren't problems in government or problems in media, but you'll have a guy talking about how like the government and all these actors are corrupt and they're trying to kill the American public and the media are all corrupt. And they'll be talking about, you know, uh, you know, some staff or some report, you know, that are written by guys that are making, you know, 50, 60,000 yeah. a year, or they'll be pointing at, you know, people working at, uh, you know, not the big hosts, but like people who are like reporters or whatever we at Fox who are making, you know, maybe 60, 70, 80,000 a year. Meanwhile, this person is making seven figures easy annually talking about like these guys are corrupt and they're bribed and they're whatever and it's like wait hold on really like and you're getting paid to say all this right i remember tim pool said something uh yeah he was responding to some criticism like people say i'm audience captured that's impossible uh we're fully funded on donations from people that watch our show and i'm like that, what do you that is audience what are you talking about like yeah jesus yeah. um yeah i mean it, i mean no, no, again it's all stupid stuff right i mean that, that yeah you know, seen some of that content it's pretty dumb um but it you know it's um but when you look at even when you look at all that stuff um that's the hypocrisy of it all. You, you hit on something here. You, you, there, MAGA now has, and the American right has its own alternative ecosystem of media. Okay, they have their own, the number one cable news channel, right? They have all these other news channels, right? They love. There's this whole game they play where they talk about the media, right? And they point their fingers at the media and they talk about how the media is this, the media is that, right? Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, you are the media. First of all, you have your own media, right? And if you calculated your batting average in terms of getting things right versus wrong, it's going to be far lower than a lot of the media organizations you're criticizing. Yeah. Right? I, I've, I've argued with people who they'll talk about like the, the media censored the Hunter Biden laptop story. It's like, excuse me, it was censored on Twitter, which is alternative media, hours. and it was published by the New York Post, which is right. arguably mainstream media. Like, what do you mean? Right. That, well, it's, you've got it completely backwards no, here. Have, yeah. No, I have a Twitter censored it for 24, 24 hours. 24 hours, yeah. And you could you could read it on Google as I did because mm -hmm. once it was set up by Twitter, but Twitter's decision to censor for 24 hours caused a spike in Google searches for it. Probably got it more traction than you could have gotten otherwise, right? Yeah. I read it because it was censored. I went to I went to Google and I searched for it, and found it on mm -hmm. the Post website, and read it. You know, so it wasn't actually censored; it just wasn't being able to spread on Twitter at that point in time. And again, it was a 24-hour decision. It was the wrong decision. I disagree with the decision, yeah. but they revoked that decision within 24 hours. But they built the whole. And here's here's how they they work though. They built an entire grievance a mountain of grievance on top of that right to the point where you can see you know um you know at least stefanik there in in uh 
um, or others are, you know, I'm sorry. Um, you can see congressmen and congresswomen in, in, in on the Hill arguing um, that somehow Twitter's decision is to censor this uh, story for 24 hours on its platform cost Donald Trump the election, right? They've gin that JD Vance made this argument just the other day, you know, that social media is, you know, censoring this Hunter Biden laptop story. You know, you know, you know there's credible research that swung millions of votes, is what he said. Mm-hmm. Poor shit, right? I mean, that's total nonsense, you know. And yet, that that's what that's what they've done now. They meanwhile, their own media, right? Their media is spreading nonsense on a regular basis, is spouting nonsense constantly. Like in know? deposition court, like that that Fox News settlement was the largest defamation settlement in all of defamation history of the United States. Giuliani right. said that he lied. It was his first time right, right to lie. Uh, Sidney Powell paid restitution to Georgia. Like it's, all, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, what, what mainstream media organization had to pay $800 million to a technology company because it couldn't restrain its own lies? Yeah. It, right. Couldn't, it couldn't stop defaming it, right? I mean, that, that's the that's the point here on all this is that is that they they've built this entire industry of nonsense, you know, and it, it and and they build their grievances on top of the nonsense. You yeah, know? and then they and they cite it like they'll say like they'll they'll invent election conspiracies and then you debunk the election conspiracies and they'll say okay, but like regardless of if you think it's true or not, look at how many people are upset about it. Something clearly happened. And it's like, yeah, what happened is the, the bullshit that right. you told them. What do you mean? Right. Yeah. You, you made them upset. Yeah, yeah. no shit. Know, they're yeah, mad. Know, you they're fucking just... lied to them for, for five years about it. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And the... yep. you know, I, mean, I had a friend, I had a friend do that with um, Pennsylvania, right? So Pennsylvania ha- is very bad at counting the mail-in votes before election day. Cause they've, you know, the Republican controlled state legislature passed laws is basically saying you can't do that. You got to wait until, you know, afterwards to count them all. So that creates a delay and that delay create then is used as sort of a window to spread disinformation and lies and myths about the election, you know? Mm-hmm. And a friend of mine was like, well, why doesn't Pennsylvania just count the votes? I'm like, because the Republican state legislature decided they can't just count the votes beforehand. And it just, it just didn't matter, right? Like they just move on to the next thing. To the next the thing, next, the next talking next point, thing, yeah. You know? I, or I asked this question, like, Donald Trump complained about mail-in ballots a year beforehand. He said they were gonna be rigged. What is one suggestion that Donald Trump made to make them more secure? It was right. nothing. It was just about getting rid of them. Um, he, tweeted, he tweeted in 2012 about the voting machines. Yeah, being rigged. He thinks the 2016 election is rigged. Remember, he doesn't think that that was a fair election. He said if you get rid of the 3 million illegal votes, he would have right, been, right. yeah. And, and then he had a com- then he had his own commission to find the illegal votes, and they closed down because they couldn't find anything, right? So this is, I mean, how do you, how do you argue with somebody like that, right? It's insane. It's like, I mean, you, you, he had all the power to supposedly ferret out these illegal votes. He had all the power to do whatever he wanted to justify his claims, mm-hmm. you know. And even in that circumstance, he came up short and couldn't, couldn't come up with it, right? And his people had to, had to close up shop. So how do you reason with that person? It's, uh, yeah, it's unreasonable. Like, the, at the same time, yeah. the DOJ was being weaponized by Obama to go after Donald Trump. The FBI, Comey, was making insane public statements about Hillary Clinton that was, like, sabotaging her campaign. And it's like, so is he controlling part of it and not the other part? Or, like, what is that? Yeah. Yeah, no, Comey— that this is the case where Comey arguably did cost Hillary Clinton the election in 2016. I mean, arguably. Like twice, I'm, I'm, yeah. Yeah, and there's more of an argument there than there is on the 24-hour censorship on Twitter of Hunter Biden's laptop story, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, Comey coming out so close to the election and saying the, the investigation is reopened in Hillary's emails. If I mean, Hillary's emails, if people don't remember this, for mo- you know, a few months prior to the election, dominated dominated headlines of every mainstream media organization whether it be cable news or print or online it didn't matter it dominated right and the the russia's hack and leak of the dnc fed storylines from the democratic national convention all the way through election day mm-hmm. dominate headlines you know um so in in terms of how they you know the whole point about Ber- the bernie sanders campaign you know, and the Democrats working against Sanders trying to undermine his candidacy, which there was some truth to, right? But that was all storyline ripped out of right from WikiLeaks. That was all targeted at the media to make sure they amplified that as much as possible. You know, again, true, but, you know, it was a very successful hack and leak operation. So there's there's all sorts of stuff like that. And Trump benefited from that. Yeah. Trump clearly benefited from that. And yet they don't want to, they never will admit that that happened, you know, mm-hmm. now. I, one of the things that's very frustrating to me is when I talk online, it's that is actually the most frustrating is the false equivalency between both sides. Like I acknowledge and I agree that there is an issue with the far left in this country. There's an issue with the far right in this country. But in my mind, the far left, they're like college kids and school administrators. 
they have no power in Congress, right? Like, like the far left hates AOC. They hate Bernie Sanders now. Like, they're not, they have no power in, in Congress. Whereas, mm-hmm. like, the far right, through the MAGA people, and it's, like, really sad because I'm a huge, I'm the biggest, like, institution simp ever. Like, I think that, obviously, we need to hold them accountable. We need to do things. But, like, our institutions are important. We need them. When somebody links me something, like, I have to tell them, like, okay, hold on. If this came out of a House Republican committee, you have to fact check everything. If like if Jim Jordan's name is on it, you can't trust anything that's being published right. here. Like it, um, th- like if Gomer or whatever is part of this, like it, this could be complete and utter bullshit, right? Um, you know, t- the, the audacity of doing all of the impeachment uh, research and all of that and publishing that 300 page whatever, and they don't even recommend you know any charges or anything else. Like what what were you guys doing? Where's what happened? To, I thought this was a waste of money. No, I thought we complained about that before with all the J6 stuff and all the Russia collusion stuff. Yeah. You know, th- that that made its money back by the way by taking stuff from Manafort who Trump pardoned, by the way. But uh, yeah, it's just like the- the way, that's, that's the kicker on Hunter Biden laptop story, right? Is they've had the laptop for several years now uh-huh. and they couldn't land an impeachment out of it, right? If this- Or charges this is, or anything relating to right, this, Joe Biden. Um, right, I mean, if this is the story that should have cost Joe Biden the election, right? If this is the this is the holy grail, you know, this this great MacGuffin of a, of a, of a, of a, of a character device, a plot device in this storyline of the 2020 election, right? Then why didn't it pay off in the end, right? I mean, it didn't. It, it didn't. Why did it fail? To, why did they fail to deliver anything that would have really been the final blow? But again, you know, this is just all. It's just an endless cycle of stupidity, you uh-huh. know. Um, and you're absolutely right, though. I mean, I, I've had that same thought many times that the crazies are much closer to the center of power on the right now than they are on the left, and that's a big. That's a big part of the problem. I mean, like, how you is your biggest fundraiser like Marjorie Taylor Greene? This woman was posting about Hawaii space lasers. That something is not working here. <laughs> Yeah, and who posts on her Instagram account that she stands with Alex Jones? Yeah, and and who's talking about the weather? The weather being controlled now to go against you know Republicans. I mean, good luck reasoning with that. You know. <laughs> yeah. Um. Well, do you? Uh, is there? What do you want uh, people to find you or search for your stuff at, or if you could link anything or have people? I don't know. You can just Google me, you know, Tom Jocelyn. I pop up every time and time. I write at Just Security, where I'm a senior fellow. I do have an X account, but I use it sparingly. I don't particularly like it. I'm not, I'm not on any other social media. You know, I don't, you know, this is this is all very much a new thing for me for coming into your, your corner of the world, you know, mm-hmm. online, YouTube. You know, I, I started watching a lot of YouTube content um, during the pandemic and saw a lot of, I saw a lot of good and bad, right? There's a lot of talented people like you doing these types of, you know, videos and streaming, that kind of thing. And there's also a lot of crap, you know, so um, you know, it's the good with the bad, but you know, I, it's something I enjoy watching. So it was, it's my first time doing one of these types of things though. So it's fun, you know? Okay, cool. Awesome. Well, hey, I really appreciate the conversation. Um, yeah, it's fun to chat and yeah, if anything ever comes up or if I email you, if you email me or whatever, yeah, we can always chat again. So, um, All thanks right, a lot. I really appreciate cool. the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Bye. What a guy. Jesus. Christ. Wait, is Josiah awake or? He might be doing a debate right now. Are you aware of Jill Stein being directly connected to Russia today and even spotted at the 10th anniversary? Uh, yeah, I, Jill Stein is fucking... Walls called Elon a dipshit? Wait, like today or in the past he has? What's new in Chrome? Today. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, Walls. I was thinking of Vance, my bad. Okay. <laughs> 